بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. In order to conclude this uh, talk about Muhammad, I would like to first of all recall everything that we have uh, already looked upon, and then end up with uh, the matter of Dar al-Islam, as if it were defining our objectives, our aims with clarity, for uh, we believe that anything that it starts with one step, it must be always aimed to its maximal consequences with clarity. What we want is the restoration of Dar al-Islam. Muamalat is only part of Dar al-Islam. It is the missing part of this equation, but it's the totality of the affair that matters to us. Masher used to say, be conservative in the short term and radical in the long term, as opposed to being radical in the short term and conservative in the long term. So take one step at a time, carefully, but aim high. Whatever you do on the very beginning, always to try to aim to its maximum possibility. And our maximum possibility here is Dar al-Islam. So the, the Dar al-Islam is nothing but uh, the caliphate, which today has become a word that almost we have to be ashamed of saying, given the fact that uh, almost everybody, the most ridiculous, comical organizations, such as ISIS, it seems to claim for themselves Never mind that we have told them a thousand times that they have nothing to do with Islam, but they keep saying, this is the Islamic State, Islamic State, Islamic State. The Caliphate is, is the noblest and the most uh, exalted form of government that there can possibly be, it is the way taught by the greatest people in, in the history of mankind. It is a way dictated by Rasul Sallallahu and uh, his companions. There is no doubt about its validity, its importance, and its in uncontroversial necessity. There is nothing in the world that it will prevent us from claiming this noble deed for ourselves. And uh, it is uh, in the account of this that we need to bring about a recognition of what this institution, foundational to Islam, means to ourselves. In the first place, the creation of Dar al-Islam means the end of nationalism. Nationalism is something so intrinsically built in these societies that it's almost difficult to understand. There is no basis for any inferior or superior treatment of anybody with a particular passport because of the, of the birth is not justified in Islam. It doesn't have any basis in the Sharia and is simply a sickness imposed to us by our former masters that they brought to us not only capitalism but this infectious way of dividing people, which is nationalism. It has to be rejected out front, it has to be negated, it has to be denounced, or in the strongest possible terms. It doesn't have any basis on Islam, it's opposite to Islam, and it has to go. Uh, there is no, we must reject the division of our people in countries that they have no basis whatsoever in the Islamic law, neither they have any foundation on any of the mathabs or interpretations or history of Islam. Simply, there's no evidence of it it has to be eliminated and denounced. Instead of a world divided by passports, artificially created by delineations, sometimes as absurd as lines in the middle of the desert or lines in the middle of the Borneo island where it, this tree belongs to this country and the next tree belongs to another, where one 
at one given time, you can have an orangutan holding himself in two different countries. Or somebody crossing the desert, imaginary, just in that particular piece of land, I have entered into this other country, as if it is the case now of our brothers in Islam, the Tuareg, the noble Tuareg, the great, great nation of Islam, the Tuareg, who found themselves under the division created by British, Italians, and English of the once their land, the Sahara Desert. Now they need five different passports to live in their own land. That is insane, unacceptable. It must be rejected. It has no basis in any condition, under any rational way of looking at it. This uh, division that uh, makes people of the same ethnic background, even the same language, to see each other as foreigners, it must be rejected. It must be rejected that our going to Mecca and Medina, that is our land, is now we are treated in our land as foreigners. It must be rejected. It must be rejected this idea that there are these people that they own our lands, that they themselves, they can dictate norms that excludes others, for it is nowhere in the lands of Islam that anybody who is uh, holding the identity of Islam by their own shahada, they can cross and they can live and they can commerce and they can trade and they can reside in our lands free, for that is the meaning of freedom. And the world has been entrenched in a, in a concentration camp with divisions artificially created in order to divide us, to break us down, to occasionally throw us each other at each other's throat in words that they have no meaning whatsoever except for the benefit of the bankers. We have to outrageously declare that this is anti-Islam and therefore denounce all the constitutions that they were imposed upon us making official, legal, these boundaries and these borders. It is in this line that I have to say how a Dar al-Islam should operate. On account to borders, we declare non-borders. The Dar al-Islam never had any borders. That's why they found enormous difficulty to put where the limits of Dar al-Islam was, because there was none. In the eyes of the Sahaba, the whole world was the come to be liberated. Uh, the, the establishment of Islam was nothing but the torch of a new, of a freedom for people, that it will be, they will be freed from the shackles of taxation, the shackles of riba, the shackles of tyranny and corruption, and uh, the imposition of artificial laws other than the ones given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only country, as I said on the first day, that is today an example of non-nationalistic attitudes is the state of Israel. They can get away with it. They can say that every Jew in the world is an Israeli citizen. Let's make every citizen in the world a citizen of Malaysia. Let's make this the land that is free from all those boundaries. And it is your passport and your identity must be only delineated and authorized by the saying of the Shahada. If they can do it, we can do it. The system by which this uh, um, way of interpreting what is to belong to people was based on the very fact that Rasul Sallallahu stretched that the Allah has, uh, Allah, Allah says in the Quran, Allah has created people in different tribes with different language for our own benefit. For our own benefit. There is in this differentiation nothing but benefit, not exclusion. But bringing the people together has proven in the past to be the very source of uh, wealth and prosperity as it has been proven in by all the different uh, Dar al-Islams that we have seen in the past. Most clearly in the city of Istanbul, a city that it was cosmopolitan like the world had never seen before. And, and from the very beginning, the sultans brought people from every part of the world that they had knowledge, a brain hunting 
of uh, the best qualities and the best services, even if they were in China, they were brought into Dar al-Islam in order to increase the quality of the people, the knowledge of the people, to en enhance the quality of our markets and our trading. So it is, that is Dar al-Islam. And there is where we have to aim. I want to propose a different way of looking at the politics of Islam that doesn't entertain nationalism, but what is the signature of the old days, because that brings us to where we are and how we can aspire to the creation of the Islam. The very unit of uh, uh, civilization in Islam is the city. And I want you to focus on this particular matter. The, the Muslims perfected the idea of the city. Uh, they strip the cities of the past from all the sicknesses that they had been accumulated. They created a city on the basis of uh, guaranteeing equality, prosperity, and uh, respect for the, the differences and the qualities of each other. It's, it's a city that in, uh, em embodies all the Sharia in, in an architectonic manner. This is trying to interpret all the things that we have learned about Mamalat in the form that we built and develop settlements and cities. For example, the cities, well, what we can say about the cities is that without a marketplace, even Khaldun argued, there is no cities. So here we have a first way of intervening in our path to Dar al-Islam. Establish cities. Build cities. And to build cities is building marketplaces. If you can bring a marketplace, if you can have a marketplace, then you can have a society of the free. If instead of a marketplace commonly owned, publicly owned by all the citizens, what you find is cities entrenched in the ownership of few in terms of the malls, in terms of the houses, in terms of the architecture, then you have a city of slaves. So the first focal, focal action is that comes about, the first arena of political intervention is not the nation, but the city. And then uh, from this focal uh, point around the city, the creation of networks of cities, leagues of cities, that they collaborate with each other, like uh, networks connected by caravans, from the market in the singular city to the caravans connected with one another. From here, you have the emergence of leagues of cities, it clusters of cities, liberated cities, that they decide to trade with each other according to the common uh, elements of the Sharia, with our own currency, with, uh, within the framework of public marketplaces, within the networking provided by the caravans. Putting trading in the axis of the building of a Dar al-Islam. And this is how we complete the picture. <coughs> These three words, Dar al-Islam, cities, trading. There is evidence, if you look at the past, in looking at these three structures as the building blocks of political and social transformation. In the absence of a centralized state, the cities take upon themselves a very powerful autonomous role 
where today it is upon the centralized, a tax-based metropolis, the capitals of each country, where you can find the flourishing of credit and money in detriment of the, of the periphery, the model that inspires, and you can see clearly in Islamic civilization, is cities that they maintain loyalty, political loyalty to the metropolis, but an economic independence from the, for the metropolis, the extent of which it has been characterized by uh, some uh, significant findings in, as you see in the, in the history of, uh, of some of our greatest cultures. In particular, as an example, the cities of Al-Andalus. One of the things that uh, emerges from uh, uh, looking at, uh, at the cities is the remarkable endurance that the city system had uh, over the centuries. To the extent that uh, without the turbulent years of uh, living in the frontier, in a war frontier, as Al-Andalus was for 800 years, remarkably, these cities maintain uh, their physiognomy integral from the day they were built to the very end of Al-Andalus. The, the system of, uh, of the cities and the autonomy of the cities is built upon the institution of the Imaret, the mosque and the market, led by a caddy. And uh, the, political, the political system embedded by, uh, represented, was represented in the cities by the castle, which uh, often was the, the seat of the wali, the governor, or uh, the Qaid, that is the, the military leader uh, throughout uh, the history of Al-Andalus. What we notice remarkably is that uh, political systems went by, passed by, the castle changed hands a thousand times, but the city never changed. So you could have, at, in, in, uh, in, throughout the history, uh, the same caddy and the same population being led backwards and forwards by several military leaders, uh, at times corresponding to entire different dynasties, and yet the city never changed. So powerful the system was that uh, upon the unfortunate conquest by the Christians, they took the castle, but they did not change the system of the markets, and because there was nothing to change when they tried to bring what they had learned from our cities to their own cities, they copy, as I said to you the other day, word by word, the laws of the market to their own cities. Is this, uh, this uh, almost immutable uh, system of trading that you find in the cities, that it should be the focus of political attention. If we are to restore a Dar al-Islam, the focus will be the restoration of this magnificent, immutable system that it lasted throughout centuries. In other words, it doesn't matter what the, the center does, what it matters is how the market is run. That is the importance that trading has, which will lead us to, again, a reassessment of how a transformation of the institutions of trading should become the core activity of a political transformation and the restoration of Dar al-Islam. So, the connection between cities and trading must be stretched upon the very institutions of Muhammad. That is, number one, the marketplace, restoration of marketplaces. Second, the institution of the caravans uh, as a way of networking the different marketplaces from different cities. Third, the establishment of guilds uh, al alongside the, each one of the cities in the periphery of the markets. The unification of contracts and the unification of currency. 
a single currency that unites all the cities with trading. That is the formula. Now, I say all this thing because I want to emphasize the contrast of other political ideas that they stretch the continuous taking over of the state. Modernism, that it has been the source of uh, uh, the modern Islam that we have to suffer today, not only brought to us the idea of uh, the Islamic banking, but also the idea of the Islamic state. And I would like to elaborate on this point as contrasting our ideas with thus those political ideas of Islamic political parties and Ikhwan uh, al-Muslimin, Jamaat al islami etc. A contrasting view is not the undertaking of the state that should be the core activity of our political engagement, but the reestablishment of the cities is not the attaining of political power that it should be the core of our activities, but the restoration of trading. It should be on the basis of uh, establishing solid structures upon the citizens that the citizens can rely upon and they can experience freedom without any form of legislation that it should be the inspiring motive. We should see those who want to legally liberate us with certain suspicion for the one that places upon himself the capacity of freeing us, will reserve for himself the capacity to take it away from us. I believe it is more inducive to freedom, our ability to have our own currency and our own markets and to develop guilds and to develop caravans and to establish Muamalat than any political engagement let anybody rule. <laughs> of course, when we say this thing, we have to put all this thing in, in inverted commas, but it's as if it doesn't matter who rules. The important thing is to have Muamalat. Look, uh, the, the system that uh, it was created with the Sahaba stretched clearly the matters of Muamalat. We have details on Muamalat of enormous importance. And yet when it comes to the election of the leaders, it doesn't really matter, as if it, it really didn't matter. Because the Sultan, the Khalifa, does not have legislative power. He's a servant. He, in a way, it could be anybody. The system by which it is elected that it has been chosen in throughout the history of Islam, we have chosen, we have seen elections between the no, noble people, and we have seen the, in, in, if we look at, into the larger part of history, monarchy, almost from the first days of Islam from Muawiyah without the beginning of monarchy, which is not a big deal. And it wasn't a big deal for the Muslims simply because the society runs autonomously from the political power. The idea that obtaining political power is the cure of our problems is part of the sickness. If focusing the way we are going to build a Dar al-Islam is not by electing a ruler. The way we are going to build Dar al-Islam is by building cities and restoring Muamalat. And that let anybody be the ruler. I say this thing, of course, with certain degree of concern, for it is not just simply anybody. It has to be as best as we can. But political, the political interference in a system of Islam is minimal. It's not that important. What it really matters is the construction of Muhammad. Well, if we bring this thing one scale down from the Dar al-Islam to the cities to trading, my point is in order to attain caliphate, we should not be looking for the caliphate. As if it were uh, some angelic character that comes and sees solves all the problem. Uh, in some occasions in 
sounds like uh, the call for some the Mahdi or some angelical figure that uh, he will descend from heaven and solve all the problems of the Muslims. But we have to construct the Caliphate from the roots. And building up the roots is more decisive to the establishment of Dar al-Islam, to establish the gold dinar as the currency of the Ummah, more decisive than trying to conquer political space within the parliaments of this or this other nation. It's more conducive to the establishment of the Caliphate, the reestablishment of a network of marketplaces throughout the Dar al-Islam, a league of cities in the Muslim world is more conducive than trying to continuously appealing to the, political, the obtaining of political power. For the political power is not where we are looking for. The parliaments don't have it. They don't have it. If you get this, uh, Mursi realized that he became the ruler of Egypt, and he was not in charge. The first thing he had to do is to borrow 1.5 billion from IMF. He had no choice. The structure, that is structure, the only thing you can do if you arrive to power is to dismantle it. So in other words, there is no power there. The power is in the banks that they have corrupted the marketplace. If we were to change the situation, we have to look to what really matters, of a focal point with me where it matters, not to try to conquer parliaments. Look at the Islamic Party of Malaysia, forever trying to obtain majority in the parliament. But if they do tomorrow, you know perfectly what would happen. You have Islamic banks, you continue with the ringgit, and you have more IMF on top of you. There will be no change one iota on the things that re really matter. They have in their quest to try to obtain political power in this way, they have to affirm things that they are unthinkable. Not only just Islamic banking as a model instead of Muhammad, but Islamic democracy and what follows. So, it must be that the focal point of our political activity is focused not on the nation, but in the cities. And that the focal point of our political activity is the restoration of halal ahul baya, the halal trading. It is on those bases that we can attain significant changes that they will be able to eliminate the, the banks. And how do we have to deal then with parliaments and, and the state? In the same way, we look at, uh, at the structures of the banks. There are structures that they need to be dismantled. They have to be broken, broken down. We are in favor of government, but not in favor of the state. And this distinction must be clearly understood. The difference between a state and government is the difference between Wadia and the bank. The state is an institution born out of the marriage, the forced marriage between government and banking. A state means government with central banks. They have integrated into a single institution, whereby what distinguishes governments is that they will not tolerate, they persecute the riba, as if it was with all the governments, not only in Islam, but also in the Christian world, where riba was forbidden. The new institution not just only allowed riba, but it married riba. The government of Malaysia is not only allowing riba is married with riba. They are themselves the procurers of riba. They finance themselves with riba. How can it be possible that is to attain this position is seen as the, at the attaining of power? But it's the dismantling of this that must be the attaining of power, which therefore focuses to some other institution altogether. What is that? Again, the city and the establishment of Muhammad. So two things we want to dismantle in speaking about Muhammad. One is nationalism. The second thing is statism. That is the principle by which government has uh, mutated irreversibly 
into this new monster that we call the state. It must be the restoration of true government that it is embodied by the legislating of Mamalat, the responsible administration of our markets, of our trading, the preservation and the forbidding of riba. So Muamalat, therefore seen as the very stepping stone towards the creation of Dar al-Islam. And this is why we say, when we mint a gold dinar in Malaysia, we don't do it for Malaysia, we do it for the currency of Dar al-Islam. So we say, one umma, one gold dinar. When we build up one market, whether it's in Johor or Kotabaru, or we do it in, in Kuala Lumpur, we do this is the market from the network of markets that they will extend from here to Tumbuktu. When we build caravans, our intention is not to reach from within the existing network, but to reach every corner of the Muslim world. When we build guilds, we do it as an instrument to liberate, to create a model that it will not only liberate the people of Malaysia, but all the people throughout the Muslim world. It is with this spirit that a unified, immutable system of Muhammad will be able to liberate us and to gather us together. In the same way, we have learned that the European Union was created by the Euro. We should think with the same strength as the dinar, as the building block of Dar al-Islam. It is through Muhammad that we are bringing this together. And we have discarded, we must discard once for all the idea that organizations such as the OIC represent us, that the, uh, such internationalism, uh, it is the tool in order to bring the Muslims together. It was not capable of bringing the dinar together, it will never bring us together. It is there to separate us. When the, the gold dinar was brought to the OIC, it was immediately dismissed. They are instruments of separation, they are not instruments of gathering. So we have to be moving in parallel and outside their frame of references. And now, let's come back to where we are. The coming out of uh, this conference and the concluding remarks on these references. We started this talk by saying, all the knowledge comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said, there is no knowledge unless we have knowledge of Allah. This is not just uh, um, interpreting knowledge in a hierarchical order. It's not only that. It's saying that without changing your condition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to know. Everything that we have said here Everything that you have learned about Riva means nothing if you don't understand your condition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything changes in, in capacity, in depth, and in fulfillment when you understand that we are here briefly only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is in this understanding, in the service of Allah, that we encounter the question of river. What do we do when we come out of this room? It will be not a reflection of how much you have understood that definition, classical definition of river, but how much in your heart it has been sealed. The fact that we are slaves of Allah, servants of Allah, and He worshipping Him and following Him means that we have to change. Understanding Allah allows you to undertake the tasks before you. If it was on account of what we own and what we have, we will find ourselves helpless, incapable. Yet, it is because we are incapable that we have to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without tawakal, we cannot move it doesn't matter how you look at the world, it will come to you like a phantom that it refuses to succumb with a power self-created by ourselves. 
uh, phantoms that they will uh, stop our action. It will impede our flow of uh, activity. It will indeed enslave us by our, our own self-creative thoughts. It is taqwa of Allah, it is knowledge of Allah that transform letters into action. Do not rely on the things that you have understood, but rely upon your heart to find the force that leads you forward. Upon your heart. The creation of Dal al-Islam is as difficult as coming out of this door. Without, without the acceptance and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of these actions is possible. They are all equally dependent on Him. It is up to us to rely upon our strength and therefore continue with our daily limitations or to surrender to Him and encounter His greatness and His possibilities by what He can do, not what we can do. We should desire Dar al-Islam with, with the same strength that we desire to go to pray this afternoon when Ma Maghreb comes. We should desire the establishment of Dar al-Islam with the same uh, energy that we undertake business practices. We should desire the establishment of, uh, of the Golden Ar with the same enthusiasm that we go and uh, undertake uh, the visiting of, uh, of friends uh, into their houses. For none of these things is more difficult than the other. When it comes to the matters of Riva, we have a command, the nature of which is unavoidable, and it is only with knowledge of Allah that it can be achieved. At the center of this activity, at the center of any activism, there must be the teaching of the Tariqa. The Sawiya, where knowledge of Allah, Taqwa, Tawakal, Marifatullah is taught. It cannot be put on the sides. It has to be brought at the center. It must be from this energy and the brotherhood that it generates, then ideas, strategies, they are developed. It is in the gathering of the people, in the networking of people, that we find the strength. The possibilities are endless, depending on how you look into it. We can look to the world and we can say, the golden art is impossible. And I can list for you thousands of reasons why you shouldn't do anything at all. But you can look at the world and I can list endless of reasons why we have no choice. That that differentiates the impossibility and the problems from the solutions and the opportunities is not reason, but is in a state of the heart. You have to therefore look into your heart to find the confidence, the certainty that it will lead you forward through company, through knowledge embodied in, in action through the, the people who have gone ahead of us that we will find the example, the courage, the stimulation in order to move forward. It's all the combination of these factors that it will see, it will allow us to move tomorrow. In the most immediate space, there are certain tasks that they have to come forward before any other one. I believe the establishment of the Golden Ar should come immediately as the condition, as the standard bearer of the restoration of Muhammad. It's simply because it is a universal affair, is because it is at the brink of collapse, the present system is at the brink of collapse, and we have all the elements in our favor in order to succeed. Then, the creation of marketplaces. The marketplaces, based on 
uh, understanding of the conditions, the elaboration of plans, the building up of uh, um, uh, models, the creation of a particular, uh, the recognition of locations, the establishment of uh, specific projects in particular cities, uh, the development of expertise, the gathering of expertise, the bringing of uh, all the necessary elements in order to construct successful projects around the idea of the marketplace. And secondly, the establishment of caravans, networks of caravans, and thirdly, the establishment of guilds. As we come out here, the responsibility must be our getting together, our coming together, our stimulating each other with the things that we have learned, expanding these ideas, bringing other people in the understanding of what Mahamalat is, and creating workshops, communities, that they will develop each one of these aspects, starting from the Golden Art and then markets, projects of markets, caravans and guilds. Networking of these communities throughout the world, from here in Kuala Lumpur to Kelantan to Johor to Singapore to Spain to, to, to Pakistan, with a focus in trading, with a second focus on the creation of building up of cities, and with the final objective of establishing a Dar al-Islam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.